Here we are again at Multivariable Calculus, this time section 11.4. Very soon we're going to be starting the meat of vector calculus, but this section is about lines and planes in space. And I'm going to begin this lesson with a, an overview of vector-valued functions, which will be studied in the next few sections. Hello. I thought I'd give you a little demonstration of what a vector-valued function is all about. Here we have um, this arm representing a vector that points in a certain direction. And it's the same vector as long as it keeps the same direction and the same length. Now think of this as your x-axis, your y-axis, and think of the z-axis as pointing straight up. When we draw various vectors in standard position, if we have a varying vector, that is, it changes in its length, and it can change in its direction. And as it does that, what it's going to do is point to points that are on a curve. For example, it could draw a circle, it could draw the same smaller circle, or it could draw a line. In fact, it can draw any curve in three space. And so a vector function draws a curve or defines a curve in three space. Stop it. So back in two dimensions we have a couple of uh, popular equations for a line. One is standard form ax plus by equals c and the other one is slope intercept form y equals mx plus b. Now if we take that first equation in standard form and add a third component for z what does that equation represent? A lot of people think that's going to be a line in three dimensions, but as we'll see, it is not. If y and z are both zero, then pretty obviously we get a point on the x-axis. And if uh, y and z are zero, we can solve for that point by dividing by a, and so we have a point on the x-axis at d divided by a. Likewise, if x and z are zero, we can solve for the point on the y-axis, would be d divided by b, and finally um, if x and y are zero, then we get cz equals d and we get a point on the z-axis. Pretty obviously these three points are not in a straight line, and in fact this equation defines a plane, and there's a triangular region in the first octant of that plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this other form in two dimensions and we're going to morph it using vectors into a an equation of a line in three dimensions using vectors. Because equations in X and or Y graphed in two dimensions are curves, or lines, lines are straight curves, and equations in X and or Y and or Z graphed in three dimensions will be surfaces, not lines or curves. For example, here's another example. If X equals 5, in two dimensions we get a vertical line. Notice that y is not in the equation, and therefore y can take on any value it wants. Now in three dimensions, that same equation will start with a point on the x-axis at 5, but y and z don't have to be 0, they can be anything. So if we extend perpendicular lines, one parallel with the z-axis and one parallel with the y-axis, and fill that in, we can see that in fact, in three dimensions, this is the equation of a plane, parallel to the yz plane, but out five units along the x-axis. So let's look at lines in a different way. Here's a line in three space. What we're going to do is we're going to take a single point on the line, a fixed point, and draw a vector in standard position, and so that vector is also fixed. And then we're going to take a second vector parallel to the line. Now when we add the green vector to the blue vector, we get this black resultant vector which also touches the line. And if we add two of the blue to the green, then we get another vector resultant that touches the line. And if we subtract the blue one from the green one, or add the opposite, then we get another vector which touches the line. And so we're creating um, many, many vectors. So sort of think of the black vector as a variable vector depending on how many blue vectors we add. And of course we could add fractions of blue vectors too. So let's call the fixed point P0 
and the fixed vector r0. I'm trying to keep the same notation as your text. And then the vector parallel to the line we'll call vector v. In other texts it's called l. And so we have our variable vector, the black vectors vary depending on t. t is a variable scalar that multiplies vector v so that, you know, if t is 1, you get the first point uh, that we talked about. And if, he, if uh, t is 2, then you get another point. If t is negative 1, you get another point, and so on. And then r of t is a vector function. And r of t is the variable vector whose tip draws the line. As t varies from negative infinity to positive infinity, you get every point on this line. So the vector equation for a line is r of t equals the fixed vector r naught, or r zero, plus some scalar multiple of vector v, where that scalar multiple runs the gamut over all the real numbers. So there again is our equation. Now if we uh, look at some more notation, r0 can be, or r0 can be written as x0, comma y0, comma z0 in component form. Vector v we're going to call its components a, b, and c because those are the letters your text uses. And therefore we can rewrite r of t as uh, in terms of i, j, and k or in vector form, either way it looks like that. Now, if we collect like terms, what do we have in front of i? Well, we'd have x0 or x0 plus ta or x0 plus at. That's going to be the x component of the variable vector and the x coordinate of the point defined when t is any particular value. So if p, x, y, z is any point on the line, then the x coordinate will be x0 plus at the y coordinate will be y0 plus bt, and the z coordinate will be z0 plus ct. These are called the parametric equations for a line. And you could continue this into as many uh, dimensions as you wanted. You wouldn't be restricted to three dimensions mathematically, although we could debate whether the real world um, includes anything past three dimensions. Now if we solve for t in each of these equations by first moving the x0, y0, z0 to the other side and then dividing by <clears throat> the components of the um, v vector, we can solve for t. Now if t equals all three of these, then all three of these are equal. And this is called the symmetric equation of a line. I, I kind of argue with the symmetric equation because it really is more than one equation. And then to review, here's the vector equation. So now we've got three different ways to express um, an equation or equations for a line in space. Okay, so now we're going to move on to equations for planes using vectors as our analysis. So here's a fixed point on the plane. We'll call that P0 or P0. And how many vectors are perpendicular to that plane? Well, infinitely many, but they would all be in the same direction. So they would all be uh, scalar multiples of each other. So we'll call uh, such a vector n, and we can pick one that's convenient with small numbers, usually with positive numbers. So then we have um, infinitely many points on the plane other than that one fixed point I chose. So we'll call that point p, but point p can be anywhere on the plane and the vector connecting it to the fixed point then would be p naught p and if we dot those two vectors together because n is perpendicular to the plane it's going to be perpendicular to any vector in the plane and therefore the dot product will always be zero. Now we'll call p naught x naught y naught z naught and the generic point that can be anywhere on the plane x y z and we'll use a b and c for vector n and so p naught p then by subtracting head minus tail is that and then if we dot that vector with n we get the following and that has to equal zero if indeed n is uh, perpendicular to the plane. By the way we, we call n a norm to the plane. And then if we multiply that out we get the following 
And AX0, BY0, CZ0 are all just numbers. So we can put them on the other side and combine them into one number. And here we have our familiar equation of a plane, but we developed it by using vectors. Okay, so now we're going to look at some examples. Number two says to write parametric equations for the line that passes through this point and is parallel to this vector. So basically they're giving you P0 and V right off the bat. So there's our equation, our vector equation. And just filling in what they gave us, we have R0 or R0 plus T times vector V. And then we combine the first components to get X, the second components to get Y, and the third components to get Z, and those are your parametric equations. Number six, write parametric equations for the line that passes through the points P1 and P2. Well, this time we need to compute V. V is parallel to the line, so if we use the vector that connects those two points, it will certainly be parallel. And then it doesn't matter which point you use for P0 and R0, so I just decided arbitrarily to use the first one. And so X is equal to the first component of P1 plus T times the component of the first component of V. Y is equal to the first component of P P1 uh, plus the second component of V times T and so on. Number 12, write parametric equations and a symmetric equation for the line that passes through the point P000 and is perpendicular to the plane x plus y plus z equals 1. The point 0000, zero, zero, zero is, of course, the origin. So there's the uh, point on the line. And then for the plane, I let x, y, and z equal 0. I mean, I let x and y equal 0, and then y and z equal 0, and z and x equal 0 to get points on the axes, which obviously are all 1. So there's the plane. There's a normal to the plane. So obviously, if the line is perpendicular to the plane, then the normal there is parallel to our line. And so we can use that normal for our um, vector v. And remember that the components, excuse me, the, the, the uh, coefficients of x, y, and z in your plane formula are, in fact, the um, components of the norm. So n is 1, 1, 1, and therefore we use 1, 1, 1 for v. And so we use the um, 0, 0, 0 for x0, y0, z0, and we use 1, 1, 1 for the uh, coefficient of t. And so x, y, and z are all just equal to t, and therefore they're equal to each other. So those are the parametric equations, and there's the symmetric equation. Number 20. Determine if the following lines are parallel, skew, or intersecting. If intersecting, solve for a set intersection. Here's L1 in parametric form, and here's L2 in parametric form. Notice that skew means they are neither parallel nor intersecting, which is possible in three dimensions. And we are in the department of silly numbers. OK, so first we'll look at V1, which uh, consists of the coefficients of t in L1, and V2, which consists of the coefficients of s in L2. And notice that if we factor out a 4 from the first one and a 3 from the second one, we have indeed parallel vectors, and therefore the lines are parallel. So now let's look at our fixed points. P1 are the, uh, consists of the first numbers in the parametric equations for L1, and P2 consists of the first numbers in the equations for L2. Now these two points could be on different lines, or they could be on the same line. We might just be starting our parametrization at a different point. So we're going to connect those two with a vector and call it w, vector from p1 to p2. And lo and behold, it's the very same vector as v2. And therefore, these two lines are the same. These two, the two points on the two different lines also create the same vector, and so the lines are coincident. They're not different lines, they're the same line. Now here's a picture. The green point is p1, and the blue point is p2 and there's vector w. 
and that's also V2. And then if we draw V1, it's the same direction, it's just a little bit longer. So it's still parallel to the same line. Problem number 22. Write the equation for a plane perpendicular to N that contains the point 3, negative 4, 5. All right, so here's the point, 3, negative 4, 5. Here's any generic point on the plane. And the red vector is N, and the black vector is, represents any vector on the plane that originates from 3, negative 4, 5. So what's the, um, what are the components of that vector? Well, we'll call it W. We simply subtract the head minus the tail, and we get that vector. And if we dot N with our vector W, it has to equal zero because N is perpendicular to all the vectors in the plane by definition. So there's the vector, uh, there's the dot product written out collecting like terms and moving the constants to the other side. Also, I, I also multiplied through by negative 1 because generally we don't like our equation to lead off with a negative. And notice that the um, coefficients of x, y, and z are the opposite of the coefficients of vector n, and so you can always have your um, norm or perpendicular vector going the other way. It's still perpendicular. Number 38, determine if the following line and plane are parallel or intersecting. If intersecting, solve for said intersection. And there's L in parametric form, and there's the plane in just a standard form. Well, this one's actually easier than it looks because you'll notice that x equals a, an expression in t, and so does y and z. So all we do is just, uh, oh, there's our little fellow. We're still in the department of silly numbers. So all we have to do is substitute and then distribute, collect like terms, solve for t, yep, department of silly numbers. And then we just have to substitute um, that number back into the um, parametric equations for the line to get our point of intersection. Silly, silly numbers. And so after we do that, there's our point of intersection. It's a single point. So the line passes through this plane. Number 42. Compute the angle theta between these two planes, and they're both given in standard form. Now, think about it. The angle between the planes is going to be exactly the same as the angle between the norms, because the norms are perpendicular to the plane, and so they're just going to differ by 90 degrees, and the angle between them will be the same. So n1 is the, uh, consists of the uh, coefficients in the equation for the first plane, and n2 consists of the um, coefficients of x, y, and z in the second plane. So how do we find the angle in between those two vectors? Well, we had, in a previous lesson, we had this formula. And in the cross product section, we had this formula. Which one do you think would be easiest to use? Well, the dot product's easier than the cross product, so we'll use that one. So cosine theta equals the dot product of the two norms divided by the lengths of the two norms, which simplifies to approximately 0.49236. That's almost a half, so theta should be close to 60 degrees. And in fact, using my calculator reveals that it's about 60.5 degrees. And now the ball is in your court, so have fun working these problems.